for it. Tonight I want to introduce Madeline Gumas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While we're checking the pronunciation of this earlier on. I've known Madeline for a couple of years because she's also part of another of the discussion groups that happens here in Fama called the Philosopher's Heart. So we may get to talk about that a little bit at some point. But Madeline's specialist subject is behavioural ecology and particularly the study of seagulls. You may have come across her because she was on the radio and even on TV a few weeks or so ago with a particular research um, paper that came out that got quite a lot of attention because people are interested <laughs> one way or another in, in seagulls. So enough of me, I will pass you straight over to Madeleine now to begin her presentation. Okay, just share my screen. I don't... Okay, well, thank you very much, Robin. Um, yeah, I'm Madeline. I'm a PhD student at the Centre for Ecology and Conservation at the University of Exeter in Penryn. Uh, well, I thought I would start um, by just giving you a bit of information about me and why I came to study gold. Um, so I moved from uh, Croydon in South London um, in 2015 to Falmouth in Cornwall and to complete a bachelor's degree in zoology. And after that, I, um, I was wondering what to do next. And uh, moving from Croydon to Falmouth is obviously quite different. And for the first time, I was actually living basically among a, a colony of herring gulls and seeing them up close um, regularly for the first time and um, getting to know sort of individuals and I thought it's quite unusual that you can see a wild animal close up for, for such a long amount of time so I thought there'd be a great study species and I've actually been to a few um, cafe side talks before and the first one I went to was actually on herring gulls so I feel like I've come full circle and I'm very pleased to be giving this talk just to give you a bit of a background about herring gulls, because I'm sure everyone's very familiar with them, but they might not know that much about them. So um, they're obviously commonly known as seagulls, but there are actually seven um, gull species that are commonly found in the UK, and they are just one of them. And they're not the most common, um, which people often think they are. Um, they take four years from hatching to reach adulthood and that's the point they get the full white and grey plumage that you can see in these two in the picture here. Um, and they usually pair for life and return to the same nest site every year um, and typically they'll lay three eggs each year. And another thing that people often don't realise that I thought was worth mentioning is that both um, male and female raise the chicks. So people often think that a bird feeding the chicks is the mum, but actually in birds it's quite common for both the mum and dads to raise the chicks, to raise the offspring. And herring gulls have got quite a complex history. Um, and this is uh, set out in a paper by John Coulson in uh, the journal Water Birds. Um, they were persecuted in the 1800s um, during Victorian times and this is actually true for most species in the UK. Um, they were um, driven, the population was driven to really low levels um, and only started to rise after um, protection was introduced and enforced, um, allowing them to, to recover and um, the population peaked in the mid 1900s after this. There's a common misconception that the reason for this growth in population was due to um, landfills and um, gulls being able to feed on new sources of food, but it's actually um, likely they're just bouncing back from really low population numbers. But over the last few decades, the population has actually been falling again. Um, the British population has decreased by about 60% over the last few decades and herring gulls are now on the red list of birds of conservation concern. Um, there are probably lots of reasons for this um, and we probably don't know all the reasons for it yet but one reason um, could be that they were um, starting to feed on landfills and getting botulism. So botulism has been quite a major cause of mortality for herring gulls, especially 
in rural areas because they're obviously scavengers and um, landfill is a, an easy source of food for a lot of goals. Um, but also um, culling is also likely to have um, contributed to this decrease in numbers. Um, historically, culling has been quite uh, indiscriminate and quite large scale, and, but recently um, it's more controlled. So now it's an offence to kill a herring gull unless you have applied for an individual licence. And um, recently um, it was also made illegal to remove their eggs without an individual licence. But despite the decline over in the country, um, herring gulls are increasingly common in urban um, they are breeding on rooftops and people are seeing them more regularly. So a lot of people don't realise that they're declining because more are moving into these areas and they're seeing them more frequently. Uh, they have a reputation for eating discarded food from people and some individuals obviously actually take food from out of the hands of people. Um, this is called kleptoparasitism usually. But um, it's quite widespread in birds. So a lot of bird species will do this, but it's quite common in gulls particularly. Um, usually um, animals will take food from another member of their own species or a similar species, but gulls, uh, herring gulls in particular, are taking food from humans. So they sort of generalize on these abilities. And because of this, they are widely disliked by people. I've seen several polls that show that gulls are, are really very much hated and perhaps are Britain's most hated bird for this and obviously other reasons. And the media absolutely loves this. Um, I just thought I'd just show a selection of headlines from some newspapers here of when um, people have had uh, negative interactions with herring gulls when seagulls which are probably mostly herring gulls maybe lesser blackback gulls which is a very similar species that is sometimes found in towns not so much in cornwall but um yeah so the media definitely paint a picture of a very like fearsome animal that's quite dangerous and just yeah you can see why people don't like them but it seems for every uh, headline about uh, a gull doing something that a human doesn't like. There's a headline about gulls being harmed by humans, often after stealing food. So people are retaliating um, or, or carrying out um, actions reflecting their dislike of, of herring gulls. So this is an example of um, human wildlife conflict. So um, usually we think of human wildlife conflict as occurring countries. So, for example, elephants in Africa and parts of Asia are often um, persecuted for um, raiding crops and big cats are persecuted for um, feeding on farmed animals and these animals are obviously large and dangerous and can also harm humans. So, obviously, it's quite a lot more serious in other countries. And um, in this country, we have removed a lot of our larger, more dangerous animals. So um, we're just stuck with goals. <laughs> um, but we know from these examples that understanding animal behavior helps in reducing conflict. For example, we know that elephants don't like bees and will avoid them. So this has been successfully used to deter them from crops. So farmers are putting beehives up around their farmland and to keep elephants out of their fields. So farmers benefit um, by keeping a steady supply of crops and elephants benefit because they're not at risk of being harmed by people hunting them in retaliation. So this made me wonder um, what uh, herring gulls are doing and how we can use their behavior to reduce conflict. So um, how, uh, what behavior might they be using from humans? And one thing I thought was a possibility was gaze direction, because um, a lot of gulls seem to swoop in from behind or catch people completely unaware. This has been anecdotal evidence and it's just something I've witnessed myself often when I've seen Gulls taking food from people, they, they've 
been caught totally by surprise because often the goal comes in from out of their field of view. So I thought this might be an indication that goals exhibit gaze aversion. Gaze aversion is basically a dislike or an avoidance of being watched or having eye contact. And it's actually really widespread among animals. But I wondered if this might be something that would um, could be useful for understanding conflict between humans and gulls when they're snatching food. So to test this hypothesis, I came up with an idea of how to measure whether gulls are averse to gaze. So I've just done a really crude diagram here. Um, I test, I targeted an individual goal to give them two trials, one where I was looking at them and one where I was looking away. So I had my head and eyes facing the goal in one trial and my head and eyes turned away in another and I um, swapped the order around so they weren't always experiencing me looking at them first time. I used a bag of chip, chips to entice them. So in this diagram, I've got the chips loose, but they were actually in a sealed bag because I didn't want to actually feed the gulls. And I timed how long it took for the gull to approach and peck at the chips when I was looking at them and when I was looking away. Um, so I tried to test quite a lot of individuals, but I found that only 19 would actually approach and engage with the task at hand, which was quite surprising. Um, most of the go away and the others didn't. But I wanted to make sure that the girls were actually motivated to eat the food. So um, when they didn't approach but stayed, if they hadn't flown away, obviously, um, I left the bag of chips in place and moved away to see if they would approach them. And half the time they did, which indicated they were motivated to go for the chips, but were put off by the mere presence of me being there. Uh, I just thought I'd show you an example of uh, one of the goals that I tested. So um, this is in Newquay. So this individual, I've, I've just put the bag of chips down, I'm looking away and he goes straight in there and pecks at the chips. So that was a particularly um, concerted effort to get those chips. Um, and then in the next trial, I was looking at him and you can see he walks over as before, but then stops and has a think about it. And at this point, I, I can obviously see what he's doing and he was looking at me, looking at the chips and walked away. And this actually went on for five minutes where he walked back and forth and back and forth and didn't go for the chips. And then at the end, I got up and walked away and he went straight in there. So he was basically um, waiting for me to stop looking at him, I think. I thought I'd show you the plot from this um, research that I produced. Um, this is... Uh, the time taken for herring gulls to approach and peck at the bag of chips. So on the left, I've got the time taken when I was looking at them in this box plot. And on the right, it's the time taken when I was looking away. So obviously, a, a box is towards the bottom showing that a, sh a shorter time. And each line um, indicates an individual and the difference in time taken. So you can see that most of the lines are going down, um, but there are some that are going up, which indicates that they, they took long when I was looking away. So there was a lot of variation there, but overall the median um, difference in time taken was 21 seconds. The goal's taking longer to approach when I was looking at them. So this indicates that goals do find a human gaze aversive. Um, being looked at seems to, it seems to be something that it, they perceive as being a threat. And the finding that some goals would not peck at the food bag at all when they're being watched um, shows that a lot of them are, ner are very nervous about approaching human. Um, and Potentially, um, for the variation in the time taken indicates that there's potentially differences in things like attentiveness. So obviously when I was looking at the goal in the gaze at condition, I could see where the goal was looking and sometimes they were looking right back at me in the eye 
and sometimes they were just looking at the chips and it was usually the ones that are just looking at the chips that would be the ones to go in very quickly um which seems quite obvious because if they're not looking at me they don't know they're being watched um it, it could also indicate a difference in temper temperament also called personality so some goals for example might be bolder than others and more willing to take risks whereas others are shyer and more likely to hang back and just wait but this experiment made me wonder when goals aversion to gaze actually develops it could be that um, it's something that's present when they hatch or it, it could be something that results from interactions with humans um, it might take a while to learn um, so to try and get try and answer this question um, i wanted to compare juveniles that had recently fledged and therefore didn't have much experience of humans Oh, I've just realised I've, I've written compared juveniles and goals. I meant juveniles and adults. <laughs> Silly. Um, yeah. And I also want to test want to test urban and rural goals, as urban goals are more likely to have more interactions with humans than rural goals. The government defines urban areas as settlements with um, ten thousand people or more, and rural areas with as being settlements with less than 10,000 people. So that's what we use to draw that distinction in this experiment that we're going to do. Um, I also wondered whether girls paying attention specifically to eyes or to head direction, because in my previous study, I had my eyes and heads in the same direction, either at the goal or away. Um, and also waiting for goals to um, to us meant that a lot of them the more nervous goals weren't then didn't participate so we wanted to get a bigger sample and we did this by approaching goals instead of waiting for them to come to us and also we get head direction constant instead of turning head away so the experiment experimenter approached with eyes and head facing forward either looking at the goal or looking down at the ground and this method is called flight initiation distance. Flight initiation distance is basically how closely can an experimenter get to an animal before it moves away. So the closer you can get before an animal moves away shows that the animal is bolder and, and less potentially less threatened by you. And if they move away when you are far away, they are more nervous. Another plot for you to look at, um, this is from um, some research which is currently in press, so it should be out soon. This is our follow-up research. So there's quite a lot to take in here and I can't point to things, so I hope it is clear. Obviously you can ask me questions at the end. Um, I've got the adults uh, on the left and juveniles on the right, and then within that uh, rural goals on the left and urban goals on the right. And then within that, you've got the um, flight initiation distance when I'm looking, well, when it wasn't me doing this experiment actually, so I shouldn't say when I'm looking, when the experimenter was looking at the goal and then on the right, the, the triangles is when the experimenter was looking away. So just to remind you that flight initiation distance is how closely someone can approach. So a shorter flight initiation distance shows um, the animal perceives the approaching person to be a lesser threat and vice versa. So we can see with the rural goals, um, they, they had a longer flight initiation distance, they were more wary. It looks like adults didn't even bother to check whether someone was looking at them or looking away before they fled. Whereas in the other, other groups, um, you can see a, a difference between at and away and it's particularly pronounced in juveniles here on the right. So to sum up that, um, we found that uh, rural goals are more wary than urban goals, which is not really surprising. Um, they are likely to be much less uh, accustomed to people. Um, it, it might be they just had less experience, or it might be that 
um, girls choose to settle in rural areas because they're less tolerant of people in the first place. The fact that juveniles respond to human gaze shows that gaze aversion is present at a young age. It, it might be that it's present when, when they hatch. We don't know from this experiment, but it would be interesting to find out. But it looks like it's something that girls are equipped with before they go out into the world and, and come across humans. It's not something they seem to learn from experiences with humans. And we also found that girls pay attention to eyes specifically, not just head direction. Next, I wondered um, how girls locate um, human food, so what cues they might use. It's um, quite likely that girls would associate humans with food because obviously um, in urban areas, and when people eat outside, especially in the summer, there's a lot of food around and a lot being dropped. So it's quite possible that they've learnt an association and would therefore use humans as a cue for food being present. So my next um, research question is, does handling food increase the likelihood that the goal will actually go and investigate it? To do this experiment, I, put, I used two identical food items. These were flat choppers because um, they're, they're made to be identical and also I thought they're likely to be similar to the sort of things girls would, would come across in their normal urban foraging. I put them under buckets um, before placing them on the ground so that girls couldn't see me handling them beforehand. And then I removed the buckets and picked up one of the flapjacks, handled it for 20 seconds before replacing it and moving away to allow the girl to approach. And then I recorded which, um, which object, if any, the girl um, kept at. Here's an example. If you all live in Falmouth, this will look very familiar. Um, this is actually a ringed gull, it's W19. I'll talk about ringed gulls at the end. So here I'm, I've put the two flapjacks down and I'm handling one. Um, the, the angle for <laughs> seeing what the gull's doing, but he me at this point. So yeah, this is um, Prince of Wales Pier. Um, and then I put the flapjack back down and uh, just needs to get out of the way. And then he's coming over and having a look, looks like he's looking at both of them, but then goes over to the one that I've handled before having a peck. And that um, concludes the trial. So um, 24 goals um, engaged with that um, trial setup. Um, and 19 of those, which is 79%, pecked at the handled food object over the non-handled food object and um, numbers that high are likely, unlikely to be um, from random chance. This made me wonder about non-food objects. Does it matter that the objects are food? Will girls just peck at anything that a human has handled? So I repeated the experiment but with non-food objects and I chose blue sponges for this because uh, I thought these are the things that girls would unlikely to have come across before and would unlikely to think would be unlikely to think they are food. Um, in this experiment, um, 15 of the 23 herring girls pecked at the handled non-food objects over the non-handled <laughs> non-food objects. And this is 65% and that, that number, it's not very different from random chance. So we can't draw any conclusions about um, girls being attracted to handled objects that aren't food. So I was ho I'm hoping from this research that we can actually start to think about reducing the conflict that occurs between humans and herring gulls. So what we know from this is that gulls do seem to prefer to take food from people who aren't paying attention, so who are looking away. So one very obvious way to um, reduce the chance of having your food taken is to increase attentiveness. So being aware 
oil holes that are around um, in the area when you're eating. Um, unlike what uh, newspaper headlines last year were saying, I wouldn't advise just sitting and staring at a gull to stop it eating your food. If you're just going to leave food down, as I did in my experiment, they're obviously going to eat it at some point. So what I think people should do instead is to be aware and of where goals are and make sure they're aware that you're looking around you as well and looking at them. And also avoid the elements of surprise when goals come over your shoulder and grab something because um, obviously you, you don't have eyes on the back of your head, you can't be looking everywhere. So what I would advise is for people to, if they're eating food, to sit uh, against a high wall or a building um, cause this, or, or under a parasol, anything that blocks goals access from behind you or from out of your field of view. We also found that goals appear to recognise food items from a distance uh, with our um, object choice study and um, handling food draws their attention towards it. It's likely that Goals have made associations between people and food because we're dropping so much food through littering. And um, an obvious um, way to reduce this um, connection goals have between humans and food is to dispose of our food litter better. Um, but that's probably easier said than done because I think most people already know that we should be doing that. So it's just getting people to do that a bit more. I also wanted to talk about future research that we're planning to do at Exeter. Um, the next one for me is what other goals, uh, what other goals, what other cues might herring goals use? Um, the next um, project is can goals remember who previously fed them? I think this is particularly important to understand because some people do intentionally feed goals and we don't know what effect this might have on their behaviour. Do they, um, do they, can you, oh, it says my connection's unstable, so I don't know if you can still hear me. <laughs> I'll just carry on if, and hope for the best. Um, we can hear you. Oh, uh, great, thank you. <laughs> um, so, Yes, if, if um, do they recognise someone who's fed them is an important question because if they don't, um, they might potentially go up to um, people who are not so friendly, which might cause, you know, obviously people don't appreciate being approached by a girl when, when, when they're just, you know, eating their sandwich and not willing to share their food. Not everyone wants to feed girls. Um, and also it puts them at risk potentially so it'd be really interesting I think to understand this better. Um, I've just included this photo here of, of someone doing this experiment or this sort of experiment with American crows um, as, as this is um, one experiment where people have found that some animals do um, recognize human faces in particular. Um, in, in this study um, crows associated people with a capture attempt which is quite a threatening encounter so um, and these crows would then alarm call and mob um, individuals that had captured them often several years later actually um, more so than um, people they hadn't seen before um, but with our experiment we'd like to actually um, make it a bit different and and look at whether an animal can I can remember a rewarding person instead of a threatening person. And this has implications for a much wider range of animals than just goals. So we're hoping it potentially would be useful to understand um, this in other species that might also be at threat from humans. We also want to know a bit more about what drives herring goals foraging choices. So they seem to be very at home in urban areas and they feed on all sorts of things that are very different from what they would naturally feed on. Um, but we don't really know if, you know, what's causing them to do this. So one thing that girls might do, because we know that they often forage among litter, so food packaging and all sorts of things, 
Um, I mean, they even pecked at these blue sponges that I put out. So they're obviously um, quite willing to check out new things, which is actually quite unusual among animals. Most animals are quite wary of new things. And it might be that herring gulls are actually attracted to um, novel objects rather than um, being wary of them. And this would be quite interesting to, to find out. So um, my colleague Emma Inzani is actually going to, is actually actually currently um, doing experiments on goals to find out whether they actually attracted to novel objects. And um, this might explain why they are doing so well adapting to urban areas. We also want to know whether goals um, prefer the, this anthropogenic food, so food that comes from humans, over their natural diet. It, because it obviously, it's potentially not very good for them. We don't really know. And finally, we also want to have a better understanding of the differences between um, herbal and, and, and goals and traditional nesting sites. So there's been some research on this, but we'd obviously like to find out a bit more because goals seem to be doing better in urban areas. They're certainly um, increasing in number in urban areas and don't seem to be doing too well in a traditional habitat. Really good if we could get an idea of how long goals are living in urban areas compared to traditional hab habitats and if they're able to raise more chicks. It seems to be that they might be able to raise more chicks, but it would be really good to quantify that. And that would suggest that urban areas are acting as a refuge for herring gulls as they are declining overall. Understanding the factors that might affect survival in urban and traditional habitats also will be really useful because it's really likely that there are very different threats in both habitats. So in traditional habitats, there might be more predators or like, the sort of normal predators because obviously humans can act as predators. And in urban areas, it's quite possible that humans and maybe domestic animals are more of a threat and cars, obviously. We also would love to know where urban gulls are actually going. So after they, um, after they fledge, do urban gulls stay in urban areas? Do they ever go into and, and start breeding in traditional colonies? Um, or, or are they destined to always be an urban gull? And are they always feeding in urban areas? Um, we also would like to know how they learn where to feed. They might learn this from their parents or from other um, fledglings, for example. Just to finish, I wanted to draw your attention to the Colouring Herringal project that's run by the West Cornwall Ring Group. Um, the rings, I'm told, uh, 457 herringals over the last seven or so years, and 361 of these are chicks, and 96 are fully grown birds or adults. Um, you might have seen them around uh, Cornwall. There are quite a few ringed gulls in Falmouth. So I've just put this picture here of W1T0, who is a regular at the moor. If you go there, you might have seen him. This um, ringing project has generated over 1,470 reported sightings. So this is really useful information coming in. And with this, we can get a better picture of, of where um, urban goals are going after leaving their parents' territories, where they start to breed, um, where they're foraging and how long they live. And um, you can report any sightings of colouring um, birds, or gulls or any other species you might see at these websites. I'll just leave them for a moment so you can see. Okay, and just to finish, I'd like to thank um, my uh, two PhD supervisors at University of Exeter, um, Nelcha Bohert and Laura Kelly, and I need to acknowledge my um, colleagues who helped with the experiment. So Izzy Burns, Tommy Collins, Leo Fordham, or really, really helpful, wouldn't have been able to do experiments without, without them. And Emma Inzani, who's been a great help as well, helping out with filming some of my trials. And she's also a PhD student at Exeter, 
studying goals so she'll be doing a lot of the research that I told you about um, and you should watch this space really. Um, also Mark Grantham who runs the West Cornwall Ringing Group. So thank you very much. Stop the, should I stop the share screen now? That's it, that's how it works. Let me see um, everyone again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Madeline, we should maybe give you a pause for you know, to relax for a moment or so. That's quite a that's all. It's quite a lot of work, isn't it, to actually watch the screens and at the same time be aware of difficulties with your connection. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit like, oh no, don't cut out now. But yeah. seems your, like your, your, sound, your sound is sometimes slurring very slightly, but never for very long, or at least. Okay. <laughs> no, part. that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, to my mind, I think we're always getting the gist, the gist of it, at least. So to remind everybody else, um, you can use the chat function to make a comment or ask a question. And as the conversation goes along, uh, myself and my colleagues will be monitoring that just to make sure that we're, we're picking up most of the issues. Um, so giving people a little time to think. Um, okay. How do you actually go about tagging a seagull, particularly a, a grown-up seagull? Because they're armed. <laughs> yeah, how, okay. How I don't, do you actually do yeah, it? Yeah, they, they definitely are armed. <laughs> um, I don't want to take the credit for tagging any goals because I don't do that at all. Um, but I do know um, Emma, who I mentioned, who, who might, I don't know, at some point, like, she might contribute I don't know I'm putting on the we spot do. there but um we, we, I know that um there are various ways to to capture a goal so sometimes you can actually with the with the more common oh, sorry more tame goals um you can actually <laughs> just grab them um which Emma has done because once um when I was on the moor about to do an experiment actually one of my experiments I found um a goal with some uh string around his leg um probably some old frayed fishing um fishing net string um and i was like oh god it, it was really obvious that he's, he was going to lose the lower part of his leg so i was like ah oh, emma i know you you catch goals can you maybe catch this one and thankfully he was very tame and she just came she <laughs> she came right over to, to put a little bit of food out just to entice him and grabbed him and it was that I was like wow <laughs> I think she just makes it look easy actually um so we managed to get him to the vet and get the string off and he, he's absolutely fine now um but yeah you can just grab them but otherwise you can use a, a like a sort of a net that <laughs> yeah. Emma's just um commented that she's been trained for many years and licensed so I should say please don't try and catch goals yourself. <laughs> don't, try, don't try this at home. Maybe. Yeah, but you can get nets that will just, you can just um, place a net either by by a nest or somewhere where a goal will come and feed and it will just like go over the top of them and then you can come and get them. So that's how, that's one way um, people can actually capture goals. If, if you're tending to capture a net, the less feral, the less, um, you know, the, the, the less wary, does that mean you might end up with a slightly skewed sample in terms of personality or um, Yes, that, that's, a, yeah, that that's a good point. It's very likely that ones that are caught um, for, for ringing and, and tagging um, are ones that are maybe a bit bolder, a bit more willing to take risks, a bit more, you know, uh, less you know like I said before about being attracted to novel objects it might be that there are certain goals that are attracted to new things and aren't whereas others might be a bit more put off by new things so I think Emma has found quite a bit of variation um, and yeah absolutely it's quite possible that the ones you bring are the ones that that are ones that you'd see close up and it and might be a bit skewed. It might and, and, and the ones that you ring when they're actually babies, they might be traumatised for life. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. I mean, they do seem to do pretty well, thankfully, because, yeah, it must be quite scary to be grabbed and have a, a ring put on your leg. But um, thankfully, they do seem to do pretty well afterwards. Perhaps you need to dress up as an even larger girl and see if you can confuse them. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually takes us on to one of the questions that was coming up. Martin asked, do, what do we know about the hearing abilities of goals? Um, whether they can recognise or understand human speech or at least a 
this, not, not the words, I imagine, but at least the intonations. Do we know anything about you focused on gaze and visual? Yeah, and really yeah. Don't know. I would say that they're probably probably more visually oriented than in, um, any other senses. They've got really good vision, but um, considering how small their eyes are, they've got, <laughs> they've got really good good vision. They can see UV. Um, they've got very good visual, what we call visual acuity. So they can see um, objects really cl clearly, quite like how we see. Um, I know the question was about hearing, but I just thought, it might be interesting to talk about vision as you mentioned it. Um, a lot of mammals, for example, um, haven't got very good visual acuity, so images don't look very clear and we sort of take it for granted because we can see everything very sharply within quite, uh, you know, within reason. Um, and uh, birds generally are very, also have very good um, ability to resolve detail as well, whereas like a, a dog or a cat, um, not very good, but obviously they rely more on their sense of smell and, and hearing. So with gulls, with hearing, um, I don't actually, I haven't ever looked at anything about gulls hearing, but I know birds generally do have very similar, um, a very similar range to what humans have. Um, so I would expect gulls to be the same. Um, generally speaking, gulls, um, animals, I should say, if, if they're making sounds um, in a certain frequency, then they obviously will hear in that frequency because they're, they're making mm -hmm. calls that that others of their so, uh, the same species can hear. So um, I expect it will be very similar to what we can hear. Yeah, I rather thought that the call of the seagull might come into the conversation at some point, but let's, <laughs> let, let's see whether anyone else picks up on, on, on that. Um, someone notices that they bite hard. Um, during lockdown, it may be too soon to say, but is there any indication of a change in their behaviour when there were fewer tourists and ingenue in the in the herring gull world? Anything you can observe? Um, I haven't seen anything about this. It will be interesting. So this is um, one area where tagging like a gps tag where you can actually monitor the movements of animals would be really useful for answering questions like this so you'd expect people who have who are monitoring animals like in real time to be able to see um if movements change um i haven't seen anything about that with gulls um and i also am a bit skeptical because like, quite a few people have said that i i think it's probably unlikely that um, very much change for goals um, and the reason for this is because although they do obviously feed um, on, on food that humans put out and stuff um, in, in urban areas they also do feed in more natural sort of natural um, places so they can they are very adaptable and they will get food from elsewhere we don't think they actually um, most of the time get a very large proportion of food from from foraging in towns and things so um, I think they would have been absolutely fine <laughs> um, yeah and also it you know being outside dropping food is just one way for them to get food from people and uh, lots of people would still be putting their bins out and not sealing them properly and they'd still be getting food that way from people so I don't think there'd be much of a change but I, I'd be interested to see any um, tracking data that, that might uh, suggest otherwise but since versatility is one of their characteristics, if there's a, yeah. a temporary change in our, our own urban behaviour, they can adapt and then resume their old habits as soon as they... Uh... I think so. Um, okay. Meanwhile, Brian asks a, a slightly larger question here about any change in the fortunes of the fishing, fishing industry and whether that may have affected both the size of the fish industry but also maybe fishing me methods. Again, is there anything that we can say about this? Yeah, I think that, um, so they, there's been, I, I'm not really very familiar with the fishing industry and, and all the different regulations and changes, so I don't really want to talk too much about that because I don't want to <laughs> say something that's, yeah, that's not true because I, I don't have a big, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> some knowledge about that but, um, but I do know that um, yeah there have been changes in uh, disc discard policies that um, previously people were able to just dump 
fish and and there have been regulations to stop that and that could absolutely have an effect um that would have been very easy food for gulls and they would have exploited that a lot and um i think there have been i think there have been studies um on i think i've seen something on yellow legged gulls which are very uh, closely related species to herring gulls which showed that um they they have to change their they have to change where they forage after after changes in fishing so yeah it definitely is something that could have an effect on populations and likewise changes in farming practice um what do you mean by that lab by far you mean like um yeah well i suppose um the movement from um manual plowing to electronic or machine operated plowing the fact that we have more and more plastic covered or um, yeah more and more stuff that, that actually yeah, I growing. yeah i'm yeah i'm not sure about that i know i know from some goals that have been uh, herring goals that have been gps um tagged that um they know that herring goals actually follow like farm like plows and stuff and feed mm -hmm. on Feed, they feed on grain, they feed on insects that have been sort of pulled up and sort of chopped up. Um, so they definitely do forage a lot in, in, in land, in, in farmers' fields. So yeah, they, if there are any changes there, then that probably would affect them as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have to accept don't know as, as the correct answer sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, fair enough, you can't know everything about everything. Um, whilst we're on the sensory range, do girls use a sense of smell? Uh, it's the, the suggestion that if you've touched something, they're more inclined to think of it as food, that we're assuming that that's visual, but is, yeah. is there any likelihood of other senses being involved? Um, I think it's very unlikely they'd be using a sense of touch. I don't think their smell is that acute. I mean, birds have been have long been thought to have basically no sense of smell, and we've only fairly recently realised that's not true. Um, so I expect that um, we know that gut herring gulls do have a sense of smell that they use. So for so I'm, I've heard of some experiments that. Um, that people did actually down here in Falmouth, um, where they um, gave gulls a, an option of um, getting food that was concealed, so they couldn't see it. Um, and and um, equally, there was, I think, a container that didn't contain any food, and they would go for the food with a container with the food in, which suggests that they were using smell. Um, but I I don't think that they would be using um, very it's probably that very strong smells are, are something they could use. I mean, other species are known to use their sense of smell for migrating um, and mm. for for being able to navigate. <laughs> so, I mean, definitely it, it's wrong to think that birds don't have a, a, a good sense of smell because they definitely do. But obviously you have to remember that these things are going to be specific to things that are relevant to um, an animal and their environment. So. Um, we're not, we don't, as, you, as we were talking about before, we don't hear necessarily all the, the range that we can hear. So um, some mammals can hear much higher frequencies than we mm. can, and that's because it's important for them to do so. And likewise, we can smell certain things, but then a dog will smell things better, like more intensely than we, we do. Um, so um, I have to think what is relevant for for different species to be able to sense. Um, I, I don't think uh, handling um, uh, human scent is gonna be something that they would use. And also remember um, when I was handling the objects, I would have handled them load, these flapjacks and things loads before I put them down. So I don't think um, the smell would have mattered really there. And they do really seem to be very visual. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to move us through some of the other questions that have been coming up. They all tend to sort of um, interweave around much the same issues, obviously. Um, Henry asks about the, the day-night, the nocturnal activity, particularly here in Falmouth, where after the pubs close, the streets go quieter, and that's when you'll often see the birds going for the bins. Again, uh, is that just what you might expect, or is that in, in any way unusual? Well, I, I would expect that um, any animal would, would um, 
go and forage when when there was less chance of of being disturbed um so yeah gulls will obviously prefer to go and rummage around bins when they're less likely to be chased off by them so if that's in the evening then they they will do that also i imagine that in the evenings when people put the, the bins out and when the food's maybe a bit fresher and and they see it and oh, and go and look then so yeah there's uh, lots of reasons but i definitely I definitely get the impression that gulls, as as you probably expect, that they, they are trying to avoid too many interactions with people. They just want to eat the food, basically. They're not bothered about. And there's also something about the phrase, after the pub's closed, that suggests that there <laughs> might be more food just laid out than on, on the Well, yeah, the potentially. Okay, I'm going to take us on through Morris in sequence. I've got Vernon here comments that a few years back he was mugged by a gull from behind on the moor. Hope you enjoyed the sandwich. Vern, we've all been there. We, we feel your pain. Um, and Peter, likewise, in similar vein, we've had talks on cats and we've had talks on girls. If the next one is on weed, we'll have covered all the pains of his life. Peter, I hate to say it, but we are going to be having a talk on weeds. It was one of the ones that we had to defer from a few weeks or so ago when our speaker was unable to attend, but that one is definitely coming back. And of course, you'll all have noticed that there's some extraordinary weed life going on at the moment. Um, now, now, Maria has a question I was thinking to ask as, as well about um, gaze. She asked whether it would be useful to have uh, eyes in the back of your head. I was wondering whether it would be a good idea to recommend people have a rear gunner. You know, if you're going to eat food in the, in the open, have somebody facing one way and somebody facing the other, covering each other's back. <laughs> do, do, you think, do you think that would make any difference at all? I mean, possibly. Uh, I know that um, people um, in some countries, to reduce the chance of being attacked by tigers, uh, obviously it's a lot more serious implications there but they've um, used masks <laughs> yeah. with eyes on the back of their heads I don't know how successful it was I'm assuming they did it because it was successful I mean um, so it seems like it potentially potentially would work because um, yeah if they, if they are just um, put off by the appearance of eyes then potentially that would be something that would at least slow them down um it's, it's just a question of whether they'd get used to that so at least with with real eyes we can actually go oh there's a girl approaching maybe i should <laughs> maybe i should move this food away whereas obviously if it's on the back of your head they might learn actually there's no consequences to it so i'm not sure did, about that but it's an interesting suggestion definitely did, did you try using fake eyes no, I haven't I mean, done. It would be quite interesting. Yeah, I think I know that um, there was an undergraduate project before I did this where they they tried doing that, um, but apparently they didn't um, get many goals to actually participate in the first place. They couldn't really draw any no. conclusions from the results. I know people have been thinking about it. But yeah, that might be something interesting to do. Um, Especially in the era where we're all expected to wear masks, you could have a sort of front <laughs> and back mask. Yeah. You? Right. Seriously, we have another more serious question here. Any reasons why herring gulls are more versatile, more kleptoparasitic than, say, the lesser black gulls, which have, which have also, says Brian, become uh, more verbal? They are. Yeah, I don't think they are. So um, it, down here, we don't see many lesser black bat gulls. Um, there are a few around, but compared to herring gulls, they're in, definitely in the minority. But if you go up to somewhere like Bristol or Bath, you'll mainly see lesser black bat gulls. Um, and they, they, it's just the same as here, but you know, with herring gulls, they're, they're the ones you see in the streets. They're the ones that um, nab food from people. So I don't think there are a lot of differences in that sense. I mean. They are, they are obviously different species with different, slightly different ecologies. So usually mm. lesser blackbacks will go and forage out to sea more than herring gulls and they, lesser blackbacks usually migrate down to Africa, whereas herring gulls are much more sedentary in comparison. Um, but they do seem to be um, adapting to urban life as well. Actually, that taps into something I was going to ask about. You mentioned that one of the advantages of the tagging is that you'll be able to notice more which birds stay in the same area and which which go out to other 
other, other territories. One thing I'd heard a few years ago was that people are beginning to wonder, to suspect that there are quite different lifestyles and quite different communities of birds with diff uh, of, of herring gulls with different different patterns although it may be that individuals can move from one group to another um, that was three or four years or so is there any more work being done on that do, do these id tagging allow you to at this stage start to draw those kinds of conclusions well, I don't think there's been that much um, more uh, tagging um, of herring gulls in the UK. The problem is that it's very expensive to do it. And um, actually, we do want to um, tag more gulls. So Emma will be hopefully tagging more gulls. She did manage to tag one um, before lockdown. Um, but um, unfortunately, the tag stopped working after a while. So <laughs> there are all these issues that come along with tagging. Um, it was very good because we, we were able to see where this goal went. Um, it was quite interesting that we could get at least for a few months to see, see where the goal had gone, but <laughs> then that was it. But um, the goal's actually back here after going up to sort of Plymouth area for the winter. Um, and you can actually, even though the tag stopped working, the goal is ringed as well. So it, it's, we can actually go and look for this goal and, and find the goal again. But <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of problems. But um, we do know that they do move around quite a lot. But also, so for example, um, in the autumn, they tend to move away. But then there are some that don't. There are some that, um, thankfully, through ringing, we can see that they stay here in Falmouth all year round whereas others don't so there's obviously a lot of variation there even though they're living very close to each other um, and we do know that um, from from ringing that gulls um, have the same foraging territories so so you always know what goal you're going to see if you go to a certain spot where you know there's a ringed goal it's likely that you'll see that ringed goal at some point um, because they do defend their territories from other goals and they will just consistently go back back to them. And when you say the tag ceased working, that's presumably some kind of electronic signaling that it's giving out. Yeah, so it, it, it I don't know actually what the problem, what the problem with, is, with it was, it just uh, stopped working because um, you get, um, you can use an app to actually monitor it, it's like, through the GPS system, it will give you updates about where the goal is, just like every so often. Um, I don't know if it's every hour or every half an hour. I don't know because I, you know, I don't <laughs> feel like I'm sort of claiming like I have a part of this. But I, yeah, um, I, yeah, I, it's it's really useful information to to be able to get this. Um, yeah, you can just look. At, sorry. <laughs> Got like thinking, going off on different thoughts. Um, it's allowed. It's <laughs> but yeah, the, yeah, you can just go on. So easy now. You can just go online, go on the app, see where the goal is at that at that given moment and where it's been. Um, but yeah, so you just get an update. And but unfortunately, it just stopped working for this one. But in the future, we should should get more. Ah, it's it's a hardware failure. Yeah, thank you, Emma. <laughs> But the question I was after, I, one of the things I was thinking of was we're particularly interested in citizen science, in ways in which ordinary people can take an interest and be scientifically aware of the world that we're in and maybe even contributing. So you don't have to have binoculars to actually read the numbers. There is some kind of messaging that you can pick up on your phone. Uh, how does this work and is uh, this right. something that any of us uh, yeah um you would have to follow? yeah sorry i probably gave a misleading sort of um impression of so so people who are part of the ringing group can can do this as a way that they can easily monitor where their the animal they've tracked has gone whereas you can actually you can um there are some ringing projects that are um not um just private so you can so you can actually go and look at them but um i think most of them are just private to the people ringing but yeah it's quite good um when you see when you're able to see um ones that are sort of open so when you can just follow some other person's mm -hmm. animal whatever it is usually birds um but see would, where they're would going. this actually not be a good idea to get 
ordinary citizens able to observe the particular goals in their area that you might get some greater sympathy if we yeah, mate, I, think, some I think yeah sense of, oh this is our goal you know yeah, I think so. I think um, um, people will find, um, understandably, of course, the herring goal is very difficult to tell apart, so they wouldn't necessarily know it's the same goal they're seeing again and again. Um, mm. So when they've got a ring on, then it's pretty obvious, like, you know for definite that that's the same goal. And it's very likely that if you go back to that place, that goal will be there. So I think when, yeah, pos quite possibly when people know they're seeing the same goal again, they might go, oh, well, that's, yeah such yeah. and such goal and today he's doing this or she's doing this yeah. and yeah I, I and do we, think we could take an interest you know. it start, starts being just like a homogenous group of goals and it's they're suddenly individuals instead of some species yes. that's they move from annoying. being them <laughs> yeah they move from being them to being people you could actually know um right um that that's possibly an idea that we can leave with the rest of your ringing group to see whether or not you might come back to us at some point and say hey guys we've got this great thing that you can get involved with but let's leave that hanging for the moment um, i'm going to go back to one of the other questions we had a little earlier on are there studies examining differences in health and longevity between urban and rural goals and particularly now this is something i'd heard as well is the urban diet negatively affecting their health yeah, so I, I haven't found any studies on this. I mean, Emma may have found studies on this, but uh, I think this is actually a key area of research that we really need to be looking into more because um, we're kind of assuming that in goals in urban areas are doing well because there's so many of them and they seem to be they seem to be doing fine, but obviously they are feeding on all sorts of things that you think might not be so good for them. So, like, is it good that they've that if they eat loads of chips and pasties or lots of carbohydrates that they wouldn't normally get you know it's it's quite it's possible that it, it doesn't it might be good short term but in the long term it might actually be a problem might reduce their lifespan but we don't really know that we don't know that just because we see a girl eating loads of chips or whatever that they're not going out and foraging on a much healthier <laughs> food source so it'd be good to get an idea of actually how much of it they're actually eating um but yeah then there are lots of other things other reasons why um the longevity might differ between urban and rural goals so yeah there could be all sorts of threats that um goals face so i mentioned culling and um, there's some areas that i think councils sort of apply for for um licenses more so than others and there's just yeah lots of reasons like predation um because obviously we we we've, we've um, as a species we've changed the landscape and and in some areas we might have made um gulls and other bird species more vulnerable to predation from other species so there are so many factors that might affect it both positively and negatively so i really think we should have more research on that well, if nothing else, because if they're eating the same diet we're eating and it's having the same effect on them as it is on us, <laughs> then, then they're more like the canaries in the cage than they are like the Viking, <laughs> Viking raiders. We, we need to know how, how bad it affects them. Um, I think I've cut, touched on quite a few of the questions that were coming up, but if there's any others that, that people feel are, are left unanswered, then please do remind me and I can come back to them. But th there was one question I was going to ask. How do you go about crafting the kind of research that you do when coming up with ideas of, well, we're interested in this, so we'll test that. W within the behavioral ec ecologists community, are there discussions about certain methods? Is there a repertoire? of approaches and interventions that you can learn from and adapt. How do you go about being a scientist <laughs> and being an experimentalist with a subject like this? Well, that's a good question because I haven't really thought about that before. Um, there's loads of yeah different ways that I think you can come at a question and uh, experimental design. So for my first experiment, um, I was, uh, 
quite inspired by some other experiments that um, other people had done um, that um, I'd heard about because my under pro undergraduate project supervisor supervised someone at Cambridge and she'd done a lot of work on gaze sensitivity and gaze aversion. So that was really great to be able to have that body of research to look at and help guide my research. But to decide whether to, you know, what to, to do to put chips on the ground and have golf come over and time them. It was, I suppose, quite a simple experiment. It's just something I thought, oh, maybe we could do that. Um, and then so you refine it after you've had the idea and obviously discuss it with your supervisors and make sure you, you know, you're not doing something really silly. Um, then with the flight initiation distance experiments where we um, approached the goals and measured how closely we could get to them. That's um, a method that is commonly used by people to measure um, risk. So usually people don't um, um, change the direction of the gaze, but they, they might change something, they might compare different species. It's just a way of, of quantifying how um, how an animal is um, perceiving being approached by a human basically and sometimes they use that as a as an indication of how they are with other predators in the environment um, and um, so yeah that's very that's um, very well known technique and uh, the object choice thing that was a bit um, a, a bit of an unusual one actually to do on wild animals because there's a lot of object choice tasks that have been done with captive animals and it's obviously a lot more e a lot easier to test captive animals because you can make sure they don't fly away <laughs> for example and uh, you know there's it was a bit um yeah it was, it was a bit um i don't know i wasn't sure how well it was gonna go but thankfully it wasn't so it wasn't too bad i mean i, I didn't mention it in this in this talk but there were a lot of times where i'd approach goals with with my buckets with the flapjacks underneath and the goal would just see me coming and fly away and it's like oh well <laughs> that's not going to work but um yeah so it can be difficult to get a good sample but um yeah it's always obviously all all science is based on previous science there aren't really i don't th think anything that's not inspired by or informed by something that's come before and and there are presumably journals and conferences where those kinds of methodology and experimental approaches are discussed and shared well yeah it's always yeah really useful to see what other people are doing and and to chat with other scientists because yeah you can sometimes it might be something that might be when you think of it, it might be really obvious but you don't don't think of it until someone says something or or they can just um help with with some methodologies refining it or whatever yeah it's really useful to see what other people are doing well i'm certainly interested in the things that ordinary members of the public could themselves adopt or start to at least do the the, the foothills of proper research the early day stuff now we have emma one of your your colleagues saying members of the public reporting is vital and why are we coloring the birds so that anybody can report them I, I, I'm, I may be working away at this too, too, too much, but it just strikes me as being very interesting. Any chance of Emma, any chance of getting you come on, coming on screen yourself at this point? You can say no, of course, because it wasn't, wasn't part of the deal at all. But would you be interested in coming and talking to us about what you're thinking to do in the future? Is Emma there? <laughs> I'll accept no for an answer if you do. If you're not keen. All right, that's that's we. Perhaps we've scared her off. Perhaps we should, shouldn't <laughs> have think, stared. I don't think she's easily scared off. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. The, 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 the gaze of a whole Zoom community might be quite, uh, you know, uh, quite terrifying. Okay, um, Emma, whilst you're thinking that over, maybe we can come back to you another time. I have <laughs> another much. question I'd like to ask. Um, Madeline, tell us about Webby. <laughs> okay um yeah so I, I mentioned that you can um uh, you can um know that you're seeing the same goal twice when goals are ringed and you can go back and see the same number on the ring but there's um a goal on uh prince of wales pier um i'm assuming everyone here's local to falmouth and they i guess probably know 
know the place I mean, but if you, if anyway, if you go along to Prince of Wales Pier, you might well see this gull who's um, got obviously gulls normally have webbed feet, but there's um, this gull has a bit of webbing missing from the right side of his right foot. So if that's a gull's foot, <laughs> I just imagine that's got foot with their three toes. Um, that that's got webbing there, and then there's just no webbing there at all. So that makes him very distinctive. So um, been watching this goal for the past four years always um in the same place i mean obviously goes out foraging wherever he goes but yeah it's just i do think that sort of thing i think that's probably how i got interested partly in in studying goals but seeing the the same individuals over again and thinking oh you know might be <laughs> might be some experiments they could do with different goals and but yeah so he, he has a nest um just by in the same territory there and um yeah uh you can last time i checked at the weekend his chick hadn't fledged yet um he another thing is he his mate i think must have died because um there was a time where he was on his own <laughs> I was like, oh, where's his mate? um and then a new girl came along and obviously you know um she's um uh, could obviously tell it was a new goal because it looked a bit different um and he was obviously a bit unsure about this new goal in his territory but she was quite keen on him <laughs> so it sounds like i'm anthropomorphizing but if you'd seen it you'd know what i was talking about <laughs> it sounds like a soap opera yeah um and eventually they paired up and yeah they've had um one chick this year so that was oh. obviously successful in the end but yeah just yeah just <laughs> So, so far, the rom-com has a happy ending. Oh, <laughs> yes, oh, bless. So okay. It's a bit tactless calling him Webby, though, if part of his characteristics... No, yeah, not. well, it's actually my partner called him Webless, which is also not a very good also, name. Also because not, it's got, uh, but it's just, we're not very original. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a nice example of how, as soon as you can identify an individual, you can start to notice their behaviour, you appreciate their life more, you can not identify with them exactly, but you can relate to them, at least as individuals. I mean, it changes the whole relationship, it seems to me. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a bit like um, people with their pets. Like when, you know, you, you obviously people think, oh, you know, dogs and cats and whatever are particularly special because they're dogs and cats. But I think really it's probably just the familiarity of no repeated interactions with an individual obviously i'm not saying that you get as much out of a goal as, a, as a, a dog or a cat that will actually you know come up and sort of greet you and sort of that sort of thing but yeah there's definitely a familiarity aspect there i think that, well, they're um, probably as sociable as a budgerigar after all we, we relate <laughs> to them because they uh, you know we we have our own um and bearing in mind of course peter's comment from earlier on about how <laughs> How how what we how we touched on something the number of the banes of his existence with cats and and girls so perhaps, perhaps we're not going to relate to them that closely yeah either, like somebody else's pet um, now Maria asked when she was little she she had assumed at least that girls were sea creatures they were found at the coast because that's where they were identified. But are they in fact common? Well, I presume we should talk about herring gulls here rather than all gulls, because as you were saying, that yeah. uh, <laughs> some of them are definitely foraging out to sea more. Are they in fact common away from the coast and just better hidden because they, uh, you know, we don't see them over the brow of the hill? Um, and is it because they're coming to these areas because that's where we are and that's where we're leaving the food out? They were originally agricultural gulls, were they not? Um, yeah they do yeah they definitely do that um i mean it really depends like individuals seem to have their own sort of foraging sort of specialization so you, you'll get some individuals that seem to often just go in in further inland follow the plow feed feed on um farmland and then there'll be others that are consistently going out to sea and foraging out there there'll be ones that are foraging on the shore and things like crabs and things like that um so uh, yeah there's a lot of variation but um mainly they are found around the coast and they they are um breeding inland but this is not 
as common as breeding on um, around the coast and on people's houses in coastal towns. So I think I think probably in coastal towns they get the best of both worlds. They they get the sea, so obviously they're sea goals. Um, so they do do a lot of foraging potentially at, at sea and on, on the shore, um, but they're also using people's houses to, to nest on because they, they don't tend to travel very far when they're breeding away from their breeding site compared to other, other types of gull. And the mention of houses reminds me, one of Peter's questions earlier on, which I skipped over on and missed. What about gull cries? There are clearly, from my experience, three or four quite distinctive sounds that they make. Um, can we identify what those cries typically mean? Um, yes, yeah, so they actually have a really broad repertoire of calls. I, I remember reading something that said they had 23. Um, I couldn't found, find an actual reference to that claim, but I decided after that that I was going to count them and um yeah they definitely have somewhere in that region of of course oh. yeah um, yeah you just <laughs> i think it was you know i've spent a lot of time just watching them and you, you do just find these things when you when you're when you're interested but yeah the most common one is obviously the what is um sometimes called the trumpeting call so when they put you, they, you often see them put their head down and they throw the head back and they're like really really loud um and this is um a very territorial call so they'll do this in response to other goals um so if another goal that they don't know flies over if a goal lands in their territory and there's food there for example they will make this call so it's it's something that it, they do quite a lot and it is um all about territory defense it seems it might possibly have a, other other sort of uses, but um, uh, I'm not I'm not very familiar with with everything. Um, to, well, <laughs> it's something that I would really like to learn more about. Actually, mm. so there's um, another example is what's called the mew call because it sounds a bit like a cat. <laughs> mentioning cats again, but it's more like it's when they uh, they often put their head sort of down and um, make their uh, open their mouth really wide and then rah, rah. <laughs> we're not very good at Jane Gold impressions um, and this is also um, territorial um, so it's usually to do with defense of like a nest site and, um, and they'll do that when when someone gets and another girl gets a bit close that's um, it's generally I think that's more of a way of going I'm ready you know because uh, animals don't really want to be in conflict with each other. They definitely don't want to fight because it's very, obviously very risky to get in a fight. So um, animals have come up with lots of different ways to signal that they are not to be basically don't fight with me because I'm I'm strong and I, I'm going to invest in defending this territory. So it's not worth it, basically. So these calls function in that way. And another call that's really um, common that you might have heard that's very, it's very dis, um, easy to discern what it means. Because um, some of the calls I just like, I, I don't really know what, why they're making a particular call. But there's also a call which I call a pair bonding call. So you will often see when the male and female are together, um, they will make a little back and forth call. So their heads will go up and they'll sort of do it in response to each other. Um, and the female will do this a lot more often um, when she's asking to be fed by the male. So the male will feed the female often before they start breeding and, and often during the breeding season. Um, and um, I think that's his way of showing that he, <laughs> he's gonna be a good dad <laughs> and he's gonna invest in her because obviously she has to lay the eggs and she's gonna lay three quite large eggs and she's gonna put a lot of energy into that. So it's really good if he gives her a bit extra food. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's often to do with feeding, but they'll do that as well um, when, when without having a feeding interaction. So yeah. Oh, well, there's at least three different ways we could go from here, but I'd better be scrupulous and stick with, uh, with following other people's questions. Um, Brian's asked um, if originally herring gulls were cliff 
nesters so that our buildings are in effect vertical cliffs or um, Vernon has suggested that they're also nice and warm when there's, or when there's heat rising from a building. Yeah. Again, can we identify how these have taken a, a place in their original ecological niche that the building now provides? Yeah, it's quite possible that girls sort of see uh, buildings as being like cliffs. Um, they don't always um, nest on, in cliffs. They do sometimes just nest on the ground, um, and but they obviously prefer places that are less likely to be predated. So um, if they do nest on the grounds, they usually prefer to be on offshore sort of places, like small islands and stuff. But yeah, mm -hmm. they, they do, they will nest on cliffs and places like that. But um, I think, um, the thing is we've, I think sometimes we forget that we've actually, you know, these buildings are there because we've built them over natural habitat. So there's probably some element of them sort of um, making the most of what is, what is available, but um, uh, rooftops do seem to be a good way to avoid um, predation from things like foxes. So it's actually quite beneficial for them to nest there. So that does sort of, um, do the job that a cliff would do. They do almost look as if they're posing, don't they? They've got, they're quite statuesque sometimes. They could be on a pedestal or a... Yeah. They probably are posing, posturing towards another goal. <laughs> uh, so they actually could be. It is, it is, it is almost they do a kind lots of, of posturing, yeah. display. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. I'd love to come back to you another time on the issue of recognizing the different sounds of the different cries because yes. again that would enrich so much our appreciation and awareness but fortunately one of the other questions i was going to ask steve has asked <laughs> something on compliment i'm interested in things like dominance and the extent to which there are social networks and uh, community structures within the herring girl community so steve helps me out here are herring girls at any level social beyond the mating bond? Is there indication of socially communicated intelligence? And certainly when you see adolescents or the older adolescents, they tend to fly in packs, they swirl around, they are definitely hanging out together yeah. like other teenagers. Yeah. So what do we know about the, the social life, the community life beyond the pair bond? So yes, yeah, as, as far as close relationships goes, it does seem to be just the male-female pair. They don't, <laughs> I, I always think of girls as being sort of, you know, they, they like to be near, uh, they like to be near each other, but not too near. So um, you've got a strong pair bond. Very um, <laughs> But um, they, they're, they're not keen on other girls, you know, being on their patch or anything like that. So you, you don't really get the cooperative breeding girls or anything like that. But um, they do obviously like, as I said, being close to each other. They are social in the sense that they will follow each other around. They will choose nest sites. If, if there are other girls there, then that, that indicates to them that that's a good nest site. They don't just randomly go and choose the nest site. Um, they um, follow so all they sometimes you might have seen this yourself so you, um if some food gets uh, you know dropped on the ground so people often say oh girls come out of nowhere like where do they come from how do they know the food's there but obviously they see you know their goals in the in the vicinity that see it other goals elsewhere if they're watching they will see the goals going down and they probably recognize the sort of flight movements that goals are make other goals are making and they will follow so they are they definitely use um social information that way um so and this is um thought to be actually why they're white in color um, so they can see um they can see other goals very clearly when you know against different backgrounds at sea and things like that so i mean i don't think it's actually 100 percent definite that's why but it does seem to make sense um they do have calls that they don't that aren't just um you know that are sort of to communicate more than just a threat or or to the to the their mate so um apparently they have a food finding call so if there's enough food that um enough goals could actually gain from it so a small amount of food the goal will just eat it a bigger amount of food a goal will make a particular call which attracts other goals 
so they will go and eat the food and obviously this is beneficial because at one time a goal will find the food make a call and won't get all the food but another time the goal won't have seen that food another goal will see it and if that goal makes the call then that one can also feed so it actually benefits um goals personally it's not that they're trying to help you know there's a, a misconception often that um that animals act for the good of the species and this isn't an indication that they're acting for the good of the species it's just there's some reciprocal sort of mm. thing that allows um goals to benefit um from from making a call and attracting others and and getting the benefit when another does and, that and if you're coming down to earth then there's safety in numbers if there's a lot yeah, of you you're less likely to get attacked by it when, when you land. but there are yeah, examples of what appear to be some kind of strategic cooperative behavior when you get a buzzard or any other raptor flying over the gulls will mob them yeah and you can easily see a dozen yeah i was watching that earlier actually there was a there's a buzzard that i think nests just near my house and um i often <laughs> hear the gulls being quite distressed by it um and actually today there was a a sparrowhawk a wood pigeon and the gulls yeah. mobbing this buzzard and the gulls yeah pigeon. the gulls are really um going for it but um yeah so the wood it really <laughs> I've actually seen. I know. I've actually seen a wood pigeon um, hitting a buzzard over head before. <laughs> Buzzards are like really not liked. Wow! Birds. Ring yeah. that bird. We want to know their life. <laughs> but yeah, so they will. Um, often you can tell when there's a buzzard around because uh, they do make a specific call when they are. So they make this alarm call that you'll be probably familiar with. So whenever there's anything that's a big, they consider a big threat, they'll make this high pitched monotonous call um but you can i often know where there's a buzzard because when they sweep towards a buzzard to try and drive it away they make a they actually like make a longer call <laughs> so um yeah and and that's likely i mean they're obviously trying to drive the buzzard away but they also want help doing that because a buzzard might not necessarily put, be put off by one or two goals chasing yeah, it but yeah. the more goals the better and and all the goals in the breeding colony will benefit from that buzzard going elsewhere um and just want to quickly say about another call because i know you're interested in the calls um there's a, a particular call that a goal will make before it flies away to forage elsewhere so it's just like a, a, a low-pitched quiet call but apparently this functions as a way to tell the other goals um that might be around it not to fly off because obviously if a goal just suddenly flies off it might be that there's a threat but there's a call to actually tell other goals no it's fine just stay there which i thought was really interesting when i heard about that mm. and i have heard that call so it's quite, yeah it's good how how could we hear about literally hear about it how could we find out this would be fascinating to have this knowledge shared yeah i i don't know it's really um i know there's there's a website called zeno canto that people might be familiar with if they are into bird watching but um you can hear different calls and songs from all species i think just about almost all species that are known in the world so like thousands of species so you can hear um calls there but um i don't know how well they're labeled and it would be nice to to actually have a, a repertoire of calls and obviously it, you know describing and writing about them you can't actually convey what they sound like which is quite unfortunate so i think i should get out and start recording it goals, needs audio recording equipment because yeah, it it'll be really because actually you could do a lot of interesting experiments by, by doing playbacks to goals and see how they respond oh, that would give you a lot so of information. They were, yeah yeah is is this your next research project well, I, I, it's definitely something that interests me, but can we all be involved yeah. in collecting just, your data? Yeah, <laughs> we'll just see what happens. But yeah, I'll definitely take you on that offer. I think that would be absolutely fantastic to do. To do. That would be just exactly a kind of, just our kind of thing, isn't it? Right. Okay. Um, I just want to check, um, Steve. Uh, you had asked if, if there's an indication of socially communicated intelligence. I'm not sure if I've actually fully covered what, what your question was about. So if there's yeah. more in that than I than I'd spotted. Please do say. Um, otherwise, I think we probably covered just about everything that people have asked. Madeline, anything in the back of your mind that you think? Um, 
was coming up and you wanted to add or no say I don't that. think so I think we've covered quite a lot so yeah thank you well the only thing I'm left with then is a plea that somehow or other, that all this information about identifying and and uh, and ringing or, or using an app if that could be made available to more people I think that would be an absolutely wonderful um, yeah and don't forget the, if you if if you see a, a colour ringed goal to report it to um, either eu-ring.org or crbirding.org because it's really, really helpful for all sightings to be reported and something uh, uh, everyone can do. Colour? Tell us again. Oh, sorry, colour, the colour rings project that I was talking about before is just, just to emphasise how, how it would be a great help for if anyone sees um, a ringed goal, so it's the blue rings in this area, um, to report it because every sighting is really helpful. So are you saying if we see something other than a blue ring that's particularly interesting or are you wanting oh, no. to on the blues as well? <laughs> um, it, yeah any uh, any ring if you can read if you can read what's in the ring any anything's important because obviously there are other people elsewhere yeah binoculars sometimes you can get close enough not to need binoculars but yeah just any uh -oh. sighting. Just but if we had really access helpful. to the app wouldn't that Oh no I'm just talking about yeah, I'm just talking about the ringed goals that you can report just okay. without having it. You just go to the website, fill in a form, and then you can get information about the bird okay. as well. So you get something out of it. Which leads us on beautifully to our final little link. Um, that at the end of this, at the end of the recording, the video that we'll make at the end of the recording will include links to all the websites and all the potential areas that people can find out more, including that sound archive or sound uh, sound recording section that you made uh, and you will find all the videos of all of our talks with the Q&A as well as the original talk um, on our um, YouTube channel which again you will find on the Cornwall Science Community or website. I think that probably covers all of the service announcements for the moment. Ah, Maria tells me that she's putting the, the info up on our Facebook page too. So there we are. We're covering as many different forms of call as, as, we, can, as we can manage in our more visual culture. So, Madeline, thank you so much. I thought that was just an intriguing, it seems almost like we're at the beginnings of opening up a huge subject. Yeah. Are you going to be staying around or is that too private a question to ask? No, I am going to be staying around for probably the next year at least. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we could we could hear more of what you're doing over the course of that. Uh, yeah, hopefully. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Might not go to plan, but yeah, we'll see. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so folks, just to end with, um, we will take a break next week. It's been quite a hectic pace getting all these talks together in, in a month. And so our, our next talk will not be next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, which is, I recall, it's, I think the 12th, something like that. Anyway, it's the Wednesday in the sequence. And that will be another attempt at a more collective discussion, the, um, the science soapbox. And what we would ask people to do is to you know, just think over a few things that you've seen in the press on YouTube or, or TED Talks or whatever over the last few weeks or months we could say maybe since the beginning of the year to give it a time scale although you can always cheat um, and what we're interested in is what people have found absolutely so interesting so fascinating that they'd like to tell more people about it and we'll see what discussion that generates. So that's our next talk in a fortnight's time, one of our science soapbox. So, right, finally, uh, the tradition that we've <laughs> developed here is that at the end of the talk, we will unmute all of our participants and ask everybody, give everybody the opportunity. Is the unmuting happening? There we go. We now give everybody the opportunity to say thank you and to uh, give a round of applause in our more traditional way. So uh, thanks so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay, folks, have a good weekend.